right, sounds good. Um, oh, session is being recorded now. I shall wait. I shall turn off this stuff. Thank you to those who are slowly joining us. I'll be moderating this session. This is Melinda Hall, and we will wait uh, for Dr. Shankar Brown to join us and hopefully some other participants as well. So uh, please hang on at least a couple minutes after the hour um, for, this uh, for this event to get started. Hello, Dr. Shankar Brown. This is Dr. Melinda Hall. Um, I'll be moderating the session. Well, good good Hi. afternoon. <laughs> how are you? Uh, good afternoon. I'm fine. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm excited good. to see the face today. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm so glad. Well, we'll wait just one or two more minutes. I want to let you know that we did start recording the session. We can talk about whether or not that session will be distributed anywhere um, post. So let's uh, touch base on that after the session. Um, but I'll wait another moment or two to see, um, to give people the chance to join, and then I will introduce you. Sounds great. Um, okay. okay. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Harry. Hello, Dr. Shankar Brown. Nice to see you. <laughs> How are you? You doing well? I'm not going <laughs> to complain. That's my, I'm not going to complain. Yeah, I know. Nice just challenging times all around, I tell you. Yeah. Heavy, heavy times. Your smile, always positive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm we got an Oh, sorry, Rajni, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm teaching a piece in Intro to Philosophy about the value of complaining democracy <laughs> maybe it's a self-fulfilling um or or a self-serving uh, reading <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, yeah uh so welcome everyone i think we'll go ahead and in the interest of time go ahead and get started uh so we'll have the opportunity to share out the recording later if dr shankar brown so chooses uh, but i'm very glad to welcome everyone to this session and to introduce dr rajni shankar brown 
She's the Jesse Ball DuPont Endowed Chair of Social Justice and Associate Professor of Education. So welcome, and uh, we're excited and looking forward to you sharing your work with us. Wonderful. Thank you so much for um, having me. And I, I just want to start uh, really in a place of gratitude and say I am very thankful for the Brown Center for organizing this today. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Harry Price, Chris Griffin, Melinda Hall. Um, I also want to thank Stetson University's Office of the Provost and Academic Affairs. I want to thank the Professional Development Committee. I want to thank uh, my dean, Dr. Elizabeth Skomp, who is absolutely wonderful, uh, and my department chair, who is um, just an ongoing support, Dr. Chris Caldwell. So I really want to uh, thank everyone. Um, for allowing me to really uh, endeavor in this journey of my summer project. And so my project was, uh, I titled it Examining Turnover and Supporting the Well-Being of Pre-K through 12 Educators in High Poverty Public Schools. And, uh, you know, this is really, to give a little bit of context, I will share that uh, this idea of kind of educator turnover and educator well-being is something that I have wrestled with and grappled in both personal and also in kind of theoretical uh, ways for, for a very, very long time. Right, so even decades ago, um, as I started my own teaching journey, teaching at a high poverty school, I came into a school uh, mid, you know, it was midway into fall, so I started in September, school had opened in August, and in this particular school, in this particular uh, classroom I was taking over, which really actually wasn't a classroom, it was a single wide trailer I was placed in with, uh, you know, very tightly packed with young adolescents, um, not conducive to learning environmentally in any sort of way, so lots of challenges, right? Uh, intersectional challenges that we see in schools. Um, but that very year, my first year as a public school teacher, I came into this uh, in September where multiple teachers had already left this role. So I was coming in, uh, you know, taking over a position where this, where my students had had multiple teachers already, and it was only September, right? And so uh, there, you know, from the very start of my journey was, was really this, uh, wrestling and I think this deep distress around educator turnover and um, I you know experienced this firsthand but continued to see it uh, you know as I've worked with schools and I, as I've kind of grown in my own journey and my career pathways and it's something that, that deeply troubles so many schools around our nations in in so many real ways and in that especially we see this issue amplified Melinda, were you saying something? Uh, no, but thank you for checking. I think there was a brief interruption in your video. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Okay, so, um, you know, so this is a really, really kind of intensified issue. And over the last three decades, we have seen an even heightened increase in terms of attrition, right? In terms of, and both in terms of teachers leaving the profession, but also in terms of educational leaders, school administrators leaving the profession. And this is also juxtaposed and paired with the daunting reality that our schools already have a critical shortage of both educational leaders in terms of school administrators and also teachers and also other educational, educational staff, right? Vital staff members to, to keep a school healthy and really to attend to the many needs of our students, uh, our increasingly diverse student populations um, that are coming into our schools with lots of uh, challenges uh, that are placed on them because of our social inequalities that exist, that persist, and that unfortunately uh, are continuing to widen. And so these are all kinds of real issues, right? And so I really uh, was grappling with some of these systemic issues for a long time, I think, in my head, in my work, finding ways uh, within the work that I do to try to help to nourish educator well-being, uh, something that I've, I've been trying to do for a very long time. And um, I finally really realized I really wanted to create a book project around this to really offer 
both uh, practitioner kind of guidance uh, and insights, but also um, advice for policymakers as well, right? And so this kind of set my path for my summer project. And um, I, I, you know, did a lot over the summer. I, I actually started by, um, while I was researching my topic more and really diving into the literature, I really also started to explore different educational publishers to really see where would this project fit. I wanted to find a really good home for this project. And so I am excited. I have found a home for this project and I'm gonna be working with W.W. W. Norton um, through their Equity and Justice series. And so I'm very, very excited about that and think, this has the potential to do a lot of good, plant a lot of goodness um, that is needed in terms of moving the needle in terms of equity and justice work. And I do consider teacher and educator turnover and well-being, especially in the context of high poverty schools, a very critical social justice issue. And um, so I can kind of share a little more with my project itself. And um, so I'll kind of, you know, share with you again, there's a lot of intersectional connections that go into this project. So I, you know, really I'm looking at it through kind of an intersectional frame, looking at issues around in our high poverty schools. They are also often very, very segregated. So we're talking about economic segregation, but also racial segregation. Uh, and we see this paired with, again, the reality of our current conditions. So um, I'm on the National Coalition for the Homeless, and we are continuing to sift through data with many national partners right now. And it is um, really, really uh, very, very depressing and heavy to not only see that we, you know, in terms of child poverty and homelessness, the numbers are continuing to rise and escalate in communities across the nation, uh, but the reality that families with children are one of the fastest growing populations um, within the homeless population, right? Fastest growing. And uh, we have many, many school-age children that are in high poverty, that are experiencing homelessness. And there are lots of issues, right, that are layered with that. And those also show up at school, right? These are all, so when, you know, we talk about high poverty schools, um, there is a lot of different kinds of, you know, um, pentacles, uh, moving wheels, uh, many kinds of systemic embedded issues um, that are very, very present and festered, right? Especially knowing our schools are a microcosm of society in many, many ways. And so, um, so a lot there, right? And um, I would just say, you know, it's interesting um, and, and very disheartening in many ways to think about how, you know, I was talking with my students recently and we were looking at different court cases and um, many of them are, are drawn to kind of Brown versus Board, right? And the idea of desegregation in schools. And as we talked about that, right, to be able to pull up maps and look around our nation and see that our schools in many ways are more segregated than they've ever been before. It is a, a deeply disheartening reality and one that I think merits our critical attention. And so, um, you know, it's interesting, policymakers, as I was diving into this research over the summer, right, um, they tend to push this idea of school choice often, right? But then you think about in 2014, um, you know, Tanya McDowell was a mother um, who was homeless. And uh, we actually got a chance to recently engage with her um, through the coalition. Um, and it was amazing to hear her story and to learn more. And, you know, so she was sentenced to multiple years in prison uh, for using the address of her babysitter to send her kinder to school um, in the affluent district of Norwalk, Connecticut, right? And so here, you know, we start to see this kind of um, irony and paradox as we talk about school choice and really who has, right, school choice and who doesn't, right? Who has that uh, opportunity and privilege and who doesn't. So um, I think it's very interesting this summer, I was looking at a lot of research to really even understand how uh, parents and guardians also kind of view these issues, right? So part of this is as I start to give guidance, I really want um, this to really be rooted in kind of 
community engagement, right, which I see as one of the most uh, strongest pieces in terms of hope and light as we talk about this kind of daunting narrative. And so um, really, you know, it's interesting, they've done some studies where many, many parents and guardians who kind of vocally voice, I am in support of uh, integrated schools, and I am in support of, you know, uh, racially integrated schools of diversity, um, but when it comes to their own kids, right, um, their choices don't always align. And there are different reasons for why parents and guardians make choices, of course, right? Um, but this also tends to be when we talk about the segregation of schools, right, trying to look at all of the different kind of educational stakeholders who are at play within a school, right? And so this was one of the aspects kind of I really explored this summer. Um, and then really looking at, you know, what fuels these high rates of teacher turnover rate, you know, turnover specifically in high poverty schools, right? And really um, current day. And so it's interesting, we have studies that exist that kind of speak to attrition, right? And, um, but they are uh, very, very limited often in scope and really diving deeply into the issues and making connections to some of the systemic issues. And so this is something that within this work, I'm hoping to uh, really kind of extend, if you will, in, in different ways. And so, um, you know, I would say that, you know, as we see alarming rates of turnover, uh, the critical shortages, and all of this also further amplified and heightened now with COVID-19, right? So this is just, it is a really, really kind of scary time um, in, in, in many ways, um, and especially for our children, right, who are at the other end. And um, I always like to say, right, if, if we are not attending to our educators' well-being and making sure that we are supporting them and we are not committed and we are not doing a good job supporting children, right? Because teachers have to be nourished and well-supported. Uh, you know, we have to make sure that we are retaining and sustaining teachers, right, in a healthy school environment in order for children, and when I say children, I mean children and youth, right? So pre-K all the way through 12, um, to really be able to get uh, a healthy educational experience, um, to be able to be in an environment where they can thrive, right? Not just survive, but thrive. And so um, these are kinds of critical issues. And so when we look at high poverty public schools, pre-K through 12 public schools um, with high concentrations of students, and a lot of times the way uh, for those outside of education, I'll share the way we kind of decide upon a school to uh, have it uh, identified as high poverty is really through the free and reduced price lunch, uh, you know, percentage at that school. And so, um, so we know, right, our schools again, um, you know, they are very, very segregated right now. Um, we have public schools, according to the National Center for Education Statistics, um, most recent studies, so 2019 coming into 2020, showing that um, we have public schools you know, vastly spread across the nation, many located in Florida that have over 75% of school or students qualifying for free and reduced lunch, right? Over 75%. And um, even when we see numbers, often um, they are underestimated, right? From my own experience, I will say that even talk about poverty and homelessness from child poverty and homelessness angles because of the way we do counts. Right. So that's something at the um, national level now I'm actually working to try to change. And um, so we have a lot of these kinds of issues that exist. It really is very, very amplified in ways um, as we see in our schools. And then you pair this with the fact that, you know, when we start to look at districts, including urban school districts, you have over 70 percent of teachers leaving within their first year of teaching. 70%, right, um, leaving within their first year of teaching. And so one thing I was very curious about that I really tried to kind of uh, investigate and, and look into this summer was, you know, when the, these 70%, when the 70% are leaving within their first year, what is happening there, right? Where are they going? 
And so um, I've been trying to kind of piecemeal, right, some of the data that exists to kind of figure this out. And we don't have a great system in terms of follow-ups and collecting that data. Um, but I have learned, right, several times um, the teachers who are in high poverty public schools who leave end up going to a more affluent and generally predominantly white school, or they end up leaving the profession altogether and switching professions, right? So you kind of see these two pathways. Um, and then the same, you know, with principals, right, uh, we have one in five school principals of high poverty schools leave each year, right? And some studies are showing one in four. So it's, it's um, really interesting. The U.S. Department of Education has a report, Principal Attrition and Mobility, that they come out with. And um, the most recent there is saying one in five. And so, uh, you know, you don't end up having this stability then in high poverty schools, and stability is super important, right, for a number of reasons. Um, when you have a student who has multiple teachers during a school year, there are inherently multiple disruptions to learning. There is inherently this kind of um, brokenness in terms of trust in many ways, right? And so it is um, really, really kind of impacts student learning, student well-being. Um, but at the same time, right, I think understanding that educators often are leaving um, because they are not, um, they are facing secondary trauma, um, you know, sometimes compassion fatigue, burnout, but also their well-being is not attended to. So I think about how you know, even if we look at the last decade, and even if we zoom in more to the last five years, we can see that we have started to make this kind of uh, push and movement through activism groups, um, even at policy levels, to say we have millions of students who are in our schools who are dealing with extreme layers of trauma. And so based on that, we have started to do kind of trauma-informed care, professional development sessions, right? starting to place into schools um, training around mental health awareness. Again, still severely lacking from my perspective. We need much more. But we've started to place these within our schools. But here's the thing, right? Within all of these discussions, we have very rarely, um, sometimes not at all, uh, discussed educator well-being and trauma. And the reality is mental health issues are increasingly high for educators, right, for very many reasons. But one, especially when you are an educator working with students of trauma, right, and you are helping to work to create healing-centered engagements. But again, if you're not um, receiving the support you need, uh, you can really experience kind of secondary trauma that becomes primary trauma, right? First-hand trauma. And so these are all kinds of um, ripples, I would say, layered issues within this whole situation um, that we're facing with, with educator attrition as well. And um, so again, the number of students um, living in poverty and our number of high poverty schools are especially high in Florida and especially high in central Florida, where we are based, right, where Stetson is based. And so this is really work that I'm um, really committed to, to trying to uh, dive into and to kind of move us into healthy, equity-centered solution space, right? Um, and that's part of this book project, what I'm really hoping comes out of this. Um, and, and we can see that, you know, many, many diverse groups are being impacted by this, right? Um, First of all, our black students and communities, right? Um, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, uh, looking at these issues within schools is, is critical, super critical, right? And we know that there are also connections in terms of um, education, incarceration, right? Um, education and homelessness um, in terms of dropout, uh, you know, and also, again, the intersectional issues, right? So you look at even in terms of youth, um, LGBTQ youth, Right, and the large percentage in homelessness, and then start to look at how many of those youth are in high poverty situations attending high poverty schools, and then you start to pair educator turnover, um, uh, educational leaders, um, and stability. You can see how these issues 
uh, to really build on each other and escalate in very, very uh, distressing ways, frightening ways. And then even Asian populations as well, right? So we tend to um, have a lot of myths where we sometimes put Asian populations and lump them in with white populations when we talk about education um, based on data, right? But these are, we have a lot of false assumptions, I think. Um, of hierarchies, racial hierarchies, first of all, but also false assumptions within data sets, right, where we tend to lump Asians all together, and yet we have sub-communities who are really struggling, right? So in Florida, we have Bengali, Hmong communities who are living in some of the highest poverty rates. And so again, all things that we have to uh, start to really kind of um, talk about, right? And I think this is hard because Often, I think, um, you know, as researchers, as scholars, as uh, educators, right, when we start to look at things intersectionally, um, things can feel really messy. It, it gets really compli complicated because it's like a web, right? You start to see connections here and there and here and there, and it makes it kind of hard to talk about, to articulate. And so, in some ways, right, it makes we to operate in silos and keep our research kind of, you know, because it allows us to articulate in a much more kind of, um, I would say, uh, you know, efficient manner, but not necessarily effective, especially if we're trying to truly advance equity and justice. And um, so again, uh, the Anne E. Casey Foundation, I've done some work with them, um, including over the summer, and um, they are really starting to highlight again child well-being, right? looking at issues of poverty with children. And in Florida, um, we are one of the lowest states. It is um, quite shameful, right? We call ourselves the sunshine state, uh, but I always like to say that there's not a lot of sunshine for a lot of people. And um, so we have wide gaps. And when you start to talk about the wide gaps, you start to look educationally and again see the segregated schools. And then you can start to see the teacher turnover. And then you can start to look into teacher turnover and start to see the lack of support in terms of educator well being, the lack of kind of genuine support that is offered, right? And so these are things that are. Um, you know, uh, exasperated uh, in ways by educational challenges and wider, larger social inequalities, um, but really, really, I believe, merit our attention. And so, um, again, you know, looking at, um, you know, what can we do in terms of really building healthier climate becomes some of this question. Um, and how can we systemically, right, embed supports? So I think about even educator nourishment, and while it's wonderful to be able to offer, you know, kind of, uh, you know, temporary nourishing kinds of things, right? Whether it's a professional development session, or whether it maybe we're we're doing some sort of stress relief package, right? That we we offer to teachers, right? With stress relieving oils and uh, maybe affirmation cards, and those are beautiful and needed very much needed. Um, but how can we start to systemically do more, right? Do more. So um, where it's it's kind of sustainable and in our schools, right? And some of these issues too, when we talk about te teacher turnover, right? Um, there's also issues around teacher pay, obviously, and benefits right now, big discussion right here in Florida and in Volusia County where we're located. Um, and so again, there's a lot of different pieces right, as we look into this. Um, in Volusia County, I will just share, right, we have some of the highest turnover um, in our schools, um, in secondary schools, um, specifically middle schools. And so even um, the middle school my son went to, that my daughter will go to next year, um, it makes me really sad, right, that the rate um, annually is nearing 40% annually of teacher turnover, right? I think last year it was um, well over 30%. and. Um, you know, this is, it, it's very real, right? And here's the thing, right? There's this kind of false notion as well that I've noticed in some of the studies that are painted out there, um, that teachers are kind of fleeing their students, right? And um, I, I would have to say in my uh, kind of my research with educators and relationships with educators, um, for the most part, this is never true, 
right? In fact, uh, their educators chose to come to these schools because they have the heart and passion and desire and commitment to try to uh, help address equity issues and to really be a part of um, helping our diverse landscapes and working with students and supporting students. Um, but often, right, the mental health issues um, often, again, the secondary trauma with no support being received um, become very, very real, right? And so that is kind of, you know, part of why they end up leaving a lot of times. And again, I wish we had more uh, comprehensive studies capturing why educators leave. We do have studies, but not the comprehension comprehensive studies, and that is something I think um, we could do a better job of as well. Um, the American Federation of Teachers, um, they have done some studies in terms of mental health and, and educators, and over 80% of teachers uh, feel physically and emotionally exhausted daily. Uh, just completely depleted by the end of their day and uh, report extremely high levels of stress. And in fact, even what they're reporting when it becomes, um, when it intersects with a medical diagnosis, it is actually, their perception is actually even lower than what might actually be the reality. So again, um, really, really thinking about trauma, thinking about mental health issues, thinking about these high levels of stress that our educators are facing, right? Um, it, it becomes very, very important. And um, we're not doing a good job of that, right? We're, we're not, you know, uh, I look again, look at the professional development um, that is offered within schools, right? And again, we're starting to offer PD, professional development and support and resources to support students in trauma, which still is even severely lacking, but at least it is visible in some ways. Um, but we're not doing the same for educators. Right. So just kind of a connection piece um, over the summer and then again this fall, um, working with schools across the nation, New York uh, City and New York schools are some of the schools that I am working with. And, um, you know, if you've been keeping up um, in terms of COVID-19, um, it is super, super uh, heartbreaking. Right. So there are districts within uh, New York City uh, now well over 4000 children who have lost a parent or a guardian to COVID-19, right? Lost a parent or guardian to COVID-19. Many of those cases, the students had a single parent. So now they are being put into foster care and there's issues around foster care. Um, many were living in high poverty and the parent that passed away was uh, sometimes the solo provider in terms of finance for the family, right? So very, very complicated issues. Right. And so it's interesting um, within these discussions. Right. I've been asked to kind of help to think about how do we support the children. Right. And one of the questions I, I keep asking, you know, is also what are we doing to support the educators? Right. Who are supporting the children. Right. And often that's a piece that is left out of the conversation and not thought about. And yet, you know, we have teachers who they are in complete trauma themselves because they have children in their classroom who've lost a parent and um, who love their students. Right. Uh, fully and um, feel and soak in all of that. Right. And are trying to um, be so many things. There are so many hats. Teachers are, there is a sometimes public understanding of what a teacher, especially a public school teacher, especially in a high poverty setting, does on a day to day basis. Um, there's sometimes this kind of lack of uh, real understanding, right? Disconnect, uh, which we need to raise more awareness around as well. And um, so, yeah, so lots of data, you know, my summer was spent kind of looking at these different pieces, um, you know, investigating different kinds of um, data sets and talking to, to individuals in schools. And um, also carrying this all with this kind of idea of wellness, right? Uh, body, mind, spirit, kind of holistic wellness as well. And um, so, you know, one thing I would share is, uh, so I'm very, very excited by how my book project is shaping and taking shape. And one of the things that I'm really committed to kind of doing in my work um, as a social justice scholar is really also looking at breaking kind of um, only Western uh, 
you know, ways or colonialistic kinds of ways, I would say, of how we tend to kind of approach um, a lot of things in our society, right, including education. And so um, within this book, right, some of the, the nourishment pieces in terms of um, healing and nourishment um, for educators, I'm trying to reconceptualize that through, um, you know, Eastern concepts, including Sanskrit concepts like Sangha, beloved community, and Naya, right, justice and action. Um, and so really trying to also kind of diversify even our approaches and how we tackle issues, right? I think um, that is also very, very much needed. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping my book manuscript, right, will ultimately offer insights and recommendations to improve educator wellness, um, to help reduce educator turnover, specifically in economically disadvantaged public schools, with the kind of ultimate goal, right, of um, also helping then to support our students who are in poverty, uh, communities, families who are in extreme poverty, um, and really looking at that from that equity-centered lens. Um, so Leanne Bell, right, she, she writes about social justice, the goal of social justice, and says, full and equal participation of all groups in a society that is mutually shaped to meet their needs is needed, right? And so I think about how do we ensure this full and active, active participation? And our students, our diverse students, have to be part of this. And for that to happen, we need qualified, healthy educators, right, in our schools. And so, um, again, I feel like supporting well-being of pre K through 12 students um, requires supporting our educators, right? In many sense, makes complete logical sense, uh, but it's something again we're we're not doing a good job of nationally, um, and in our state, uh, very, very uh, lots of work to be done. And so, again, this is kind of a call for action, um, a critical examination around turnover and uh, that is elevated in high poverty schools and identifying, right, culturally relevant kind of strategies to reduce educator turnover. And, um, you know, within that, right, I would share that, um, you know, it is really, really interesting um, this summer being able to, I'm just so thankful for our summer grant at Stetson, and I hope that uh, we can continue to offer, a, you know, and expand, right, that, because I think that is um, something that is so supportive, right, as an educator scholar, um, you know, where you're given kind of the gift of both time and space to actually uh, really dive into the research in meaningful ways and to also contemplate and wrestle with things. And so I had a lot of time this summer, in, in, you know, to work on this. And I um, found myself so interested, you know, there are some outlier schools that I am now in process of trying to dig and learn more into. And so Edison Elementary School is one, uh, located in San Diego. They have a poverty level of 97%, uh, very, very high poverty. But their teachers tend to have 18.3 years of experience on average, and they have one of the lowest in terms of teacher turnover rates, right? So something, it is working there in ways. And so um, really looking to, right, to kind of do case studies to say, what can we learn, right? What is happening there? And in the, the kind of uh, up till now, right, my kind of learning around that is I am starting to see, um, you know, various pieces, right? Uh, community support being huge, uh, school leadership, uh, collegial relationships, right? Uh, this kind of overall emphasis, equity-centered school culture. Uh, and also, um, many times, kind of this open, vulnerable space uh, and empowerment to do what is needed within the curriculum to attend to different kinds of needs. And um, so there's just, there's a lot of different operational pieces, and I'm very, um, uplifted to see things that are working, right? And also trying to see how can we replicate those things, adapt some of those things, what are common commonalities we can take from that as we learn and move forward, um, you know, all of that kind of uh, good stuff, right? And I know I will just keep talking. I just realized it's already 1236, and I will continue to talk and talk and talk about this because I am 
very passionate about it. And, um, you know, in many ways, this is all my life's work. And so I know that Melinda, Dr. Hall, was going to ask some interview questions as well or just have some conversation. And I do also want to leave time to open up for conversation. So I will come to a pause. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Shankar Brown. And yes, I will uh, sort of get us started with a couple questions that I've been formulating as you're speaking. Um, and then I had a couple questions already come into the chat, which I've added to my list. And I want to invite anyone who is um, at this session to add a question to the chat. And then at, after a few moments, we'll see how things flow. I'll open it up to folks to unmute themselves and speak and engage more freely. Um, so one of the things, one of the tensions that I noticed in your presentation um, is that between sort of qualitative and quantitative data. So you picked out at least three or four different ways in which you're seeing quantitative data tell false or misleading stories, whether or not that's because of the way that folks are counted by ethnic uh, or, or racial categories, um, and or whether or not that's how we identify high poverty schools. Um, you mentioned a couple of other things that are difficult about um, our quantitative studies. Yeah. So could you speak a little bit to how you see a good balance between qualitative and quantitative when it comes to your research? Absolutely. Um, thank you for that wonderful question. And so, you know, that is, you know, I, I really believe in kind of the merits of mixed studies, right, uh, you know, in terms of research. Uh, and per Personally, I do tend to favor qualitative, right, in all transparency. I am a very, you know, avid qualitative researcher. Um, but I would share that, you know, um, you know, as we look at data sets, sometimes it's kind of, at least within the educational realm, especially uh, kind of the arena I work in, um, data is often just kind of picked up and used in so many different ways without ever being analyzed itself. Right. And this is really problematic because often very, very critical decisions are being made based on that data. And if that data is anchored in or based on kind of uh, false premises or bias, uh, you know, then you end up having kind of this ripple effect of issues. Right. Uh, that are often uh, more problematic than helpful. And so um, I do try to balance that very much so with qualitative data. Right. And so for me, the qualitative is where I'm able to get a lot of the richer insights, the stories behind things, being able to break down even when we're seeing those numbers, right, whose voices are not being heard, whose stories are not told there, who are the ones who have created these data sets, right? Let's look at the diversity there because there's going to be natural lenses and bias that comes with that, right? And so trying to make sure that, that this all takes a lot more time, right? But I think that it is really valuable and needed, right? That we do take time to look at things in kind of deeper, more complex ways, right? Instead of kind of a single story, if you will. And um, so that's where I kind of try to mix um, that and in this, book, right? That's, I will do a lot of that, right? So even as I speak, and I'm bringing in some national data sets, for example, making sure that I'm pairing that with some of the qualitative and bringing in stories and voices um, to make sure that we have this kind of, um, I would say, a more balanced, but also a more, hopefully, moving towards a more kind of accurate depiction. So great question. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, and I just got a question um, that I'm going to actually put to the head of the line right now because I had several sort of elements of this question in my own notes. Um, and essentially, uh, this this person, Dr. Dr. Price, asks, um, how do schools in our county compare to schools in other regions? So let me couch this mm -hmm. in a couple of the remarks that I was hoping to get the chance to ask you more about. Um, you mentioned using uh, being engaged in New York City. You mentioned a case study in a place very unlike this, which it, I, the Bay Area, right? Um, yeah. And um, so I guess I want to know too, what is unique about Central Florida? You said our numbers are very high. Is that something that you feel like might be an outcome of your book that you would be able to answer that question? Or do you feel like you already have some of the answers to that question? Um, so how do our schools here in this county, our schools compared to others? Okay, so yeah, Florida, we have um, enormous amounts of work to do. And so um, to be honest, um, to answer Dr. Price's um, 
question. Um, I would say we have some of the um, most troubling issues that are really, really visible and not being uh, attempted to even be addressed, right? So it's really, really deeply distressing. And um, I would say that Central Florida, um, really, really high issues, right? So even if we start to narrow in even more within Florida, and some of that, a lot of that, right, I would say is um, these intersectional issues that are at play, right? So first of all, poverty and homelessness is extremely high. One of the very reasons I came here, right, to Florida, um, because we have such high numbers in terms of child poverty and homelessness here, um, very, very high. And there are lots of different reasons for that, right? Uh, some is kind of a, well, some are intersected with with racism right, and sexism. Here it's a very much a women's issue, right? And so um, looking into that, and I speak to that also in this book, right? Single-headed parents and also incarceration, right? Many times families are broken up. So you start to see the intersection of all of these kinds of issues at play. Um, and we are located, right, in the deep South. And so uh, lots of work to do there. But then also even think about um, just in terms of environmental conditions, right? So for, for many folks who are in homeless situations, um, sometimes Florida, the weather, um, even though sadly every summer we have folks who die of heat exhaustion, right? So different than kind of ice and snow conditions. But overall, it seems to be more of a climate, right, that you can kind of survive in some ways. Um, and then you think about natural disasters that have recently happened, right? So even in Puerto Rico, in surrounding areas, and how, um, you know, we've had many, many families come into schools, right? And they are, um, de you know, really dealing with uh, the trauma, the challenges of natural disasters. So you have all of that, right? So Florida makes for a very kind of interesting state, if you will. In Volusia County, um, we are just so highly segregated still, economically segregated in terms of our schools, racially segregated in terms of our schools, um, you know, really, really high issues. And it's interesting, funding also is a huge part of all of this too, right? And so right now, you know, we were, uh, you know, talking with congressional um, officers about different funding avenues within homeless programs. And folks, you know, there's priorities that are given for funding for different things. And a lot of that is also um, based on somewhat of a national narrative, what folks are kind of nationally pushing forward, right? And so it's interesting, in fact, one of the conversations we just had uh, two weeks ago, right, um, one of my colleagues, Donald and I, we were speaking with, you know, congressional officers. And so we, it, this becomes a hard thing because you don't want to take funding away from anything where funding is needed and severely lacking. But at the same time, there seems to be this kind of misunderstanding where, um, okay, if we're going to give we realize right now, right, there, there is so much attention on kind of um, incarceration, right, issues of incarceration. So we're going to put more funding into that. But then what happens where you're not giving funding into schooling, and let's look at the school to prison pipeline, right, and let's look at direct impacts there. Let's look at direct impacts to families, right? So wonderful if you're trying to um, support right, what is happening within our prisons and helping. We need that. We need that. But we also need it down below. We need the preventative measures to happen, right? We need to go into the roots. And so um, there's just so many issues that are just um, really, really kind of festering. And I think often they're operating silos instead of very kind of multidisciplinary approaches to, to trying to fix some of these. And so um, our schools here, back to Dr. Um, Harry Price, we have a lot of work to do. Um, Volusia County Schools is, uh, you know, even in terms of, um, you know, when you start to look at even, uh, you know, teacher, educator, mental health, educator turnover, extremely high, extremely high, right? Um, start to look at, um, also start to look at, um, you know, the student end of things, right? Where students are um, very, very disconnected in many ways, sometimes to curriculum, um, you know, and so I think, you know, there are, these issues are also interwoven as well, right? And so um, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. Turn on your mic, Harry. I appreciate your response because um, having, uh, you know, my wife uh, taught in the teaches yeah. in the public schools, and I've done a lot of work. And 
one thing that I've always recognized when I've gone to various schools um, on either, you know, all over Volusia County, Seminole County, Warren's County, is the marked disparity, differential, yes. right, um, with regard to the environment that is, you know, available for the students. Yeah. And, you know, in more, uh, more instances than not, goes through my mind is how in the world are these kids ever going to learn anything yeah. they are already you know by fifth sixth grade they're already you know at a really bad disadvantage you know yeah. and it breaks my heart yeah. and then you know i go to another segment of the another portion of, of the county or another county and you know it's like night and day and i always wonder my other part of my next question I had for you is, you know, let's just look at this Volusia County School Board. Yeah. I know that they have finite resources and their hands are tied and all these kinds of things. But what are they really doing to address this in a legitimate way? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it is, um, it is very apparent that the teachers are beyond burned out. Oh yeah. They love in many instances, yeah. ones that are really dedicated. You know, they 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 are totally committed to their students. Yes. Yeah. And then that impacts all sorts of things downrange. You know, yeah. their families, etc. Because their student, you know, they're doing their work. They're spending their money. You know. So what is? For, have you had an opportunity to really dig in with with the Volusia County School Board at any point? Yeah. So, you know, I think, um, I think again, you know, you start to see this kind of um, disconnect of really understanding um, the real issues because they, there has to be a commitment on the part of those board members to say we're really going to take the time to dig in and understand and listen right, to those who are, who are sharing. And um, unfortunately, that is not always the case, right? And so I think, um, again, this is where, you know, I think, first of all, you know, educational stakeholders, community, we have to collectively come together and speak out and almost kind of demand that these issues are, are paid attention to, right? So, you know, we're not going to let go. And it's not a one time, one board meeting during the course of the year, because that's what how these issues tend to go. Right? We bring it up once, okay, and then it's not brought, you know, um, it has to be this kind of persistent discussion around this, right? And so, really, when you think about Volusia County Schools, I mean, you were bringing up how the students, right, so many of them are so below grade level and ways, and um, and absolutely, right? And I will share, even so my own son, right, Valen went to a high poverty middle school that has huge teacher attrition. And now when he got to high school, he's in an engineering academy. And, um, you know, major gaps he's had to work on to catch up with peers who didn't come from a school, right? Who came from an economic or segregated schools, right? Or who came from a private school, right? And, you know, so these were, and these were hard decisions as a parent I had to make, right? Because, you know, um, but from a social justice cap, I try to keep them in public schools, right? In high poverty schools. And there are reasons for that. Um, and I think there are also um, other, you know, gifts, that privileges that are also got that we tend to look at things from a deficit ideology. But high poverty schools here in our area do have many gifts as well, right? And their students are one of them. They are amazing, right? I get to work with them and have some of the most um, resilient, passionate um, students, right? Skilled students. But it's very sad when you start to look at it academically, you really start to see um, major differences. And for many children, right, school is it. And so if they don't get it at school, right, when they come home, it's not, and it's not because their parents don't want to be able to give it to them. They're working three jobs trying to just get food on the table, right? Trying to survive. We have a severe lack of affordable housing in our area where we live. And so, um, you know, they're not able to supplement outside of school, right? So in the case of my own children, Yes, they go to high poverty schools, but I also recognize I can supplement outside, right? I have the privilege of saying, okay, I can take you to a Stetson concert, right? Or I can, you know, have you introduced to different things. So many don't. Um, and then you start to look at the teachers and um, they are severely impacted, right? In so many ways. And I know for a fact that, um, you know, students that my wife 
has taught and that I've interacted with. School is not just get the education. It's a safe place. It's a safe harbor. And they get emotional support yeah. from, the, from the teachers that care, you know. Um, and it is, it's just devastating to see some, some of what is, uh, you know, the kind of potential that can be lost. Yeah. You know, it's just yeah. really so thank you. Yeah, no, it, it, it is very sad because all children, we like to say it's an achievement gap and it is not. It is an opportunity gap, right? Our children, all children have the potential to achieve and to shine as do all teachers, right? When they are put in an environment where they're nourished and healthy and supported, they get to be the best that they can be. But the reality is we have an opportunity gap based, you know, rooted in our social inequality where we have a lack of opportunities and access for so many. Um, and these, and in order to, to kind of solve and, and move the needle, it's going to take collective impact and efforts. I really believe that. Um, thank you, Dr. Shankar Brown. So I want to um, transition us into open discussion now. Um, Chris uh, has a couple questions about waivers and mentorship. And I'll just earmark that I really appreciate this discussion. And I know we won't get the chance, but um, I'm always wanting to talk uh, with you and, and, and others about choice, disability, and incarceration. I think there are really rich opportunities here. So if we had more time, I would ask those things, and I'll just turn it over to Chris uh, at the moment, and then anyone else who would like to join the discussion, please do. Um, one of the big things that you talked about was first-year teachers uh, and their op their, their choosing to leave the classroom. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, what are your thoughts on mentoring and peer support uh, inside the school, not in the county? Um, as a uh, as kind of a, a preventative measure to help them stay in the uh, classroom. Yeah, I think it's huge, Chris, especially when it's done correctly, right? When it's done well, when you know, when when those who are peer mentors are also given. Because here's what what is happening in some cases, right? Some cases, even where we have the good mentorship happening, I see the mentors are actually crumbling behind the scenes because they are so overextended and they are not supported, right? So we we don't want to fix one thing but add to another thing, right? So we need to find ways. And so time is a valuable and precious resource, right? That needs to, um, I think, really um, be given, right? To those who are in these roles. I do think that peer mentoring and support can be huge though. I've seen it with our own students. So um, all of our own students, right? When they go into schools, um, you know, one of the things I encourage those who are going into high poverty schools right away, a lot of times they'll come to me, you know, Oh my gosh, I'm struggling. These are real issues, right? Yes. And you need to have a mentor within your school as well, right? So let's find that. Um, and it becomes somebody who you can trust, somebody who you can bounce ideas off, somebody where sometimes you just need to cry and, and have somebody see that and feel that with you and understand that with you, right? And so um, mentoring is huge. And I think there's so much room for us to do a better job with that. So I appreciate that question, Chris, and I, I do think, and that's one of the things in my book, that's one of my kind of solution areas I'm going into. I have another question, unless someone else does as well. I'll uh, see the, uh, thank you so much for sharing your comments. Okay. Um, so my next question was, uh, what, do, what are your thoughts on the waiver system that we are currently using in the state of Florida? Um, do you see it as a detriment to the health of our educators as a whole? Um, seeing as more resources are usually pushed towards those educators that are coming into the classroom without the certificate or the teaching license and things of that nature. Yes, so here's the thing. We have a very real issue where we have a critical shortage. So you have to have teachers in the classroom to teach, but when you do have folks coming in, you know, the one thing is when they're coming in, sometimes with lived life experience, there's the gifts that come with that as well, right? But if you don't have the educational training, um, and, you know, and real active support, um, it can be very hard. And a lot of times those who are coming in are also trying to get the licensure as they're in the classroom. So they're having to study, they're having to take classes. Many of times they have families. So you can start to see kind of the ripple of uh, challenges that are very, very real. So I think that the waiver system is, uh, you know, I think that in some ways it's needed. But what I would like to see is we create a system that doesn't need a waiver system, right? Where teachers aren't fleeing and leaving and we're more want to enter the profession, right? So that would be kind of in an ideal world. Um, I think until then, 
what do you do, right? We need, we need folks in the classroom, right? I'm thinking about, you know, as we were doing this, let me just tell you, right? My son is texting me from school, mom, can you come and get me? You know, uh, there, the shortage of teachers, the teachers are pulled in multiple directions right now. So what do they do with the students? They lump them into the auditorium or into the cafeteria. You have tons of high school students just sitting in there for half the day. Oh, we have, not we have, a use of time. Right? Not a useful use of time. That we're sitting in the auditoriums, up to almost 200 students at Mainland High School. Not there definitely. you go. Because you saw it yourself firsthand. Yeah. Um, so the other one was, uh, and we're seeing this just specifically in the pandemic, um, we're seeing teachers that are, that are having to teach online courses and also at the same time in this hybrid format that we are doing here at Stetson. Yes. Uh, but training is very minimal compared to what we could have provided here at Stetson. Yes. Uh, and, and second uh, is, is that um, providing that and dealing with the connection issues and things of a child that is supposed to have seat time. Yes. Um, it, it's, it's difficult, and I wonder what will happen with that seat time. Yeah. Uh, they still count it if the kid isn't connected. Yeah. Um, uh, for the requirements. Luckily for us, while it is, we require them to go to the classroom, it's not a hard legal piece of uh, uh, the requirement uh, all the time. Right, so. right. Very good, good point there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there's just, there is so much that needs to be changed in so many real ways. And um, yeah, it's, it, it, it's a lot, you know, um, a lot. And I think, you know, this project, I'll just kind of share as we kind of, I have to end soon because I teach class. So that's the only reason. Otherwise, I would love to stay here the rest of the day. And talk this. Um, but I would just share that, you know, as I'm working on a particular book project, um, I'm so grateful to, even in the midst of all the heaviness and the issues, to have the space to be able to reimagine, right, and to be able to open and say, well, let's look at things and what can we do differently? And um, that's something I'm just really grateful for. And, and um, I'm grateful for Stetson's support in that way as well. So thank you. Um, I, I love it. I love all the comments. I don't know if we're able to, um, if those comments can be sent to me so I can read them later. That would be awesome. I would love to because I really will, um, you know, take that to heart and appreciate that. And um, and I'm so grateful for everybody's time today. Thank you so much again for organizing this, Chris and Harry and Melinda. Thank you for the wonderful questions. And um, and then again, you know, um, Dean Scomp and my chair, Dr. Caldwell, just major shout out for your ongoing support. It means a lot. So. Thank you very much. Well, and we will respect your time and let you go. That